Thank you for coming out tonight uh, to the second of our spring series um, on the theme of this year, which is stuff. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by my department, the History of Art Department, and also by the Mellon Penn uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art Object-Based Learning Initiative, which is a collaboration we have between Penn and the PMA. The Wolf Humanities Center is generously sponsored by the Wolf Family Foundation, the Hershey Family Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Office of the Dean in the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, I want to offer warm thanks to our wonderful staff members, without whom none of these events would happen, Sarah Varney, Sarah Malinsky, and our graduate student assistant, Juliana Barton. Um, I also want to thank uh, the people who have supported our American Sign Language Interpretation Program, so the interpreters, Dr. Jamie Fisher, Pen in Hand, and the Department of Linguistics, the Excellence Through Diversity Fund in the Provost's Office, the President's Office, the Pen Language Center, and the Office of the Dean of Arts and Sciences. Our next event in the Stuff Series will be on March 27th at 5 p.m. here in the Rainey Auditorium, and we'll be featuring Dr. Stuart Gray, who is from the University of Strathclyde, who is going to be speaking on the history of space debris. He's going to be talking about our role in polluting space and the question of what we can do about it. Dr. Gray has also done really important work in bringing non-traditional students into the study of physics and astronomy, and I'm greatly looking forward to welcoming him. I think it's going to be a very interesting talk. So tonight, I get to introduce and welcome Dr. Sanchita Balachandran, who is the Associate Director of the Johns Hopkins Archaeological Museum and Senior Lecturer in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at the Johns Hopkins University. Balachandran is an active teacher, and in that role, she engages with her students how conservation techniques can help us better contextualize and understand objects from the ancient world, and how to think more critically about the link between conservation, cultural heritage, social justice, politics, and memory. She is the director of Untold Stories, a nonprofit organization that pursues an art conservation profession uh, that represents and preserves a fuller spectrum of human cultural heritage. As a researcher, she engages and publishes on a wide range of topics that all grow out of the question of what stuff has to tell us and how it speaks to us. One current project, for example, explores what the production techniques of Greek vases might reveal about their authorship. Another collaborative project aims digitally to reconstruct the faces of two ancient Egyptian mummies. Um, in a powerful talk delivered on May 25th, 2016, entitled Race, Diversity, and Politics in Conservation, Our 21st Century Crisis, which was delivered in the wake of having participated in the Commission to Review Baltimore's Public Confederate Monuments, Dr. Pal Balachandran discussed who gets access to the training that enables you to speak with authority about the stuff that matters and how to preserve it, and how that question of access to training helps to determine the way that we decide what does matter and what doesn't matter and to whom. She offers this challenge, and I quote, our profession, the profession of conservation, is at a turning point. We can maintain the status quo as the world changes around us, making us even less vital to the urgent concerns of the day. Or we can acknowledge our own past and begin to think and work differently in the present. What is at stake here is not what conservation is, but what conservation could be. Conservation, she writes, in the 21st century can no longer just be about objects. Conservation also has to be about the people whose lives are inscribed on them." End quote. She is renowned for challenging us to think about what our relationship to precious cultural stuff reveals about our relationship to people and the consequences of the questions she is asking and the research that follows in their wake allows us to see how the work of history can evolve in transformative ways and how alive, political and important this work of history and conservation, museums and universities always is. So it's a great honor to welcome her here and please join me in welcoming her. I'm here to speak to you about something that's been on my mind for quite a long time, so I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I want to start by saying that we meet on the ancestral homeland of the Leni Lenape, and I respectfully ask for permission from their ancestors and descendants for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I also want to thank the Wolf Humanity Center, the University of Pennsylvania, specifically um, James English, Sarah Varney, Sarah Malinsky, Julie Davidson, of course, Karen Redrobe, 
for the invitation to speak here about stuff. Um, I'm obsessed with stuff, so this is perfect for me. Um, I'm also grateful to our ASL interpreters, um, Brandy Mazik and Donna Ellis, for their work this evening. Uh, and it's a delight to be returning to Penn, um, where I have such wonderful colleagues in the conservation department here. And I actually used to come here as a graduate student some 20 years ago now, when I was at NYU, um, to take classes in the historic preservation department. Uh, so this opportunity to return and speak is both an honor and a reminder that I was a lot younger um, when I used to come here more frequently. Um, the work I share with you was made possible through the support of the United States India Education Fund um, with a Fulbright grant um, some 10 years ago, and I've been haunted by this archival work ever since. And I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the staff of the Government Museum and the Tamil Nadu State Archives, both located in Chennai, now Chennai, South India. I'm really grateful for their dedicated stewardship of the rich museum and archival collections in their care. And by chance, or perhaps by fate, I actually discovered that my own paternal grandfather had been studying the exact same collections in the 1930s and 40s that I went to study in 2009. So I'm especially indebted to these institutions for letting me meet him again. Um, I'm also happy that my parents are here in the audience. Um, they've been hearing about this archive for a long time and are probably wondering when I'll be done with it. And the good news, or perhaps the bad news, is that I, I probably won't ever be done with this. Um, so thank you to all of you for indulging me in um, sort of returning to this place that I really love. Um, tonight I'm going to tell you stories that took place in colonial India in the southern administrative region known as the Madras Presidency, so in the southern part um, of India here. Um, and we will specifically be spending our time at the Government Museum in Madras, which I show you, um, Madras now Chennai, which I show you in an image here. And though the museum was founded in 1851, I'm going to begin in September 1940, when the museum's superintendent or director, uh, Frederick Gravely, seen here, exchanged letters with a Miss Alice Monroe, a registered nurse with the Canadian Baptist Mission in Sarango Gunjam District in Orissa. And you can see uh, Orissa is up here. Um, and this was regarding a recent and unusual museum acquisition. He writes to Miss Monroe, thank you for the two spiders safely received. The mature one I've preserved, but I still have the young one alive. They belong to the tree and thatched roof hunting genus uh, Poecilotheria, which sometimes preys upon small birds. We have no examples of the species in our collection, so we're very glad to have these. But our grant for purchase of specimens is not large enough to enable us to purchase much more beyond archaeological specimens, and we rarely pur purchase zoological ones. This year, most of our grant has already been pledged for the acquisition of bronze treasure trove images. If you can secure a male spider specimen, it will be particularly appreciated, as the male usually has the best specific characteristics. Um, I give you a spider warning, because I'm going to show you a picture of the spider. Um, and here's the spider. It's this spectacular looking creature, and it is the size of a human hand with a bite deadly enough to kill small children. Um, now, there's a lot to unpack in Gravely's statement that will help us guide the, the rest of this talk, so I hope you'll indulge me as I take it apart a little bit. Because even though Gravely's talking about spiders, I think he's really describing how a museum fundamentally works. First, he differentiates between something that's preserved and something that's alive, um, even though both things are fundamentally the same, spiders, and both in the museum. Second, he tells us that when these things are living, they are dangerous, preying upon small birds. And then he tells us how the museum works, seeking representative examples to enhance the collection, based presumably on some sense of scarcity or quality. And then he tells us the categories of things that the museum collects. Uh, and this is very true of museums today. They collect zoological things, archaeological ones, but the money is for archaeological things. Um, and this suggests a hierarchy or preference for acquisition, one he's perhaps not that thrilled about. Um, and the bronzes he mentions, for which he does have money, will be the main focus of our study tonight. And finally, he says that male specimens are preserved. And I point this out because the story I will tell you, based primarily on archival research in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, preserves very few women's voices, certainly not any Indian women's voices, but a few non-Indian women, such as Alice Monroe. So to summarize in this short paragraph, we have an excursus on collecting institutions and how they work. 
that they choose to keep some things alive and they kill others to preserve them, that living things are potentially dangerous, that collecting institutions have certain plans in mind um, and decide how they're going to tell certain stories. Um, and this is all the more important, I think, to keep in mind when we're looking at a colonial archive, as we are, which tells us some of the story, but certainly not all of it. Now, Alice Munro responds almost immediately to Gravely, sending him four days later, I mean, the Indian Postal Service, amazing, um, four days later, a box of 20 living spiders, <laughs> adding that, quote, they may, however, fight and kill each other by the time they get there. And then she asks in a let the letter to Gravely a stunning question, which I think is just incredibly powerful. She asks, may I know how you kill them to preserve them as specimens? Now, in case you're wondering, and you want to do this on your own, not recommended, this spider is um, highly endangered, uh, gravely advises her to kill them with chloroform and then submerge them in enough ethanol such that the ethanol won't be, quote, much diluted by the spider's juices, unquote. Though they're talking about spiders, it strikes me that this is a question that governs all of us um, working in museums and what the museum does with the things, the stuff that enters them. The museum has an unfortunate reputation of being a mausoleum where dead things go, or as in this case, living things go to be killed and have their juices extracted to be made into specimens. And while Alice Munro's question seems to arise from the dead 80 years ago in colonial India, these questions about the, what the museum does with stuff, some of which was very much alive on arrival, is something that's quite current. So what has to leave the body of things in order to turn them into specimens? Are museums just filled with exoskeletons of once living things? And here's where living with an archive makes it possible to believe in, you know, beyond this sort of simple binary of living and dead. Because the documents associated with the government museum suggest that the things in the museum do not sit comfortably as stuff. They have, drawing on words from the archive, and I'm quoting words here now, life, whole and mutilated bodies, spirits, shadows, ghosts, heavenly presences, and malignant diseases. So as we sit here in the museum filled with stuff, how creepy a night at the museum are we willing to imagine? So tonight I will spend most of my time talking about objects that we as a contemporary audience might view as primarily religious objects or perhaps art or archaeological objects, but we should keep in mind that these are our categories. To read how these images functioned and were understood in colonial India generally and in the government museums specifically in the late 19th and early 20th centuries is to acknowledge that the very nature or status of these things was vigorously debated what they were, who they belonged to, where they should be kept, how they should be cared for and used. These are all questions that I hope to explore. And I should say at the outset that I'm not a specialist in South Asian religions, nor a historian of Indian art, or even a historian of South Asia, though I've been especially inspired by the work of scholars such as Richard Davis, Vidya Deheja, and Tapati Guha Thakurta. My interest is that of an art conservator, a person trained in the preservation of specimens, a caretaker of stuff. And as a conservator, I'm always interested first in the material characteristics of an object of the past. What is it made of? What did it look like in antiquity? And what do those physical characteristics tell us about the social, cultural, political, and economic interactions between people in the past, but also in, their more, in the more recent lives of these objects? Because the physical thing can sometimes tell us things that are otherwise hidden or ignored. But I'm also a museum administrator, a stuff manager. And in this role, I'm particularly interested in how objects enter the museum, the people and places they come from, the negotiations that took place as the process of transfer occurred, and what happens to objects once they enter the museum space. And for this, we need paperwork, records, receipts. Um, and it's for these two parts of my professional identity that I especially love the Government Museum Archive because it offers an opportunity to deal with both the material characteristics of objects as well as the stories associated with those objects. Um, because the archives preserve, somewhat une unevenly of course, we're dealing with a colonial archive, um, the voices of British colonial officials, Indians embedded in the British colonial administration, Indian religious devotees and practitioners, and Indian communities who are interacting with these objects. And what emerges from listening to these different voices that haunt the archive is that the same physical thing, of course, has different meanings for different communities. And the context in which the physical thing is kept is, has really important consequences for how the thing is understood or used. And it's not so much the thing that changes as 
how much, you know, as, as how we see it that changes. So my interests then are to kind of look primarily at point one and two and to spend a little bit of time on the third point. So where does stuff come from and to whom does it belong? And here the, the phrases used in the archives talk a lot about bodies. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on arguments regarding the body. How should we take care of stuff once it's in the museum? And here, again, the archives, the language changes from bodies to material. And finally, what does stuff in the museum make us do, and what do we do with stuff? And here, the language gets very strange indeed, where there are all of these sort of in-between things that exist. All right, so let's begin with where stuff comes from. Now, the government museum was initially conceived as a compendium of Indian stuff, products, a place where geological, biological, ethnological specimens were acquired alongside more recently manufactured goods such as textiles, wicker work, um, metal work. Um, and the museum had an encyclopedic mission to contain and display all of South India, a kind of typical colonial project. Um, the museum's records do not actually mention what we might call art or archaeology as a collecting category until really 1898. And archaeology only becomes an official collecting area in 1901, 50 years after the museum's founding. But what we might call religious objects, and perhaps art and archaeological objects, began to infiltrate the museum before that. And this is my little um, Photoshop attempt at that. In 1912, it was reported that three large images of the Hindu god Shiva as Nataraja were displayed on the, quote, entire landing at the top of the staircase in the new building. And they were reported to have, quote, provided a source of attraction for caste visitors as they were seated on the top of the staircase. Um, now, the term caste visitors here refers to Indian visitors who were presumably followers of Hinduism, though we don't know if anyone ever asked. Um, and these images were likely placed up here for convenience. They were huge, some of them life-size several hundred pounds, um, and they really didn't fit with any of the other categories of objects being displayed in the museum. So this was a convenient place to have them. Um, and in fact, the museum had no real interest in acquiring these types of things, which were seen as somewhat grotesque cult images, evidence of the excess of human religion, quote, mumbo jumbo in the name of one colonial administrator. But what they actually were, functionally, if you want to call it that, um, were utsavamurtis, or festival images, certainly in the Hindu context. And they are temporary embodiments of God that were meant to be carried in procession outside and around temple precincts on festival days to greet and bless assembled devotees. And museum administrators felt that such things were not meant to sit still in the museum. But in fact, it was the British colonial administration that insisted on museums collecting these types of objects. And the 1878 Indian Treasure Trove Act sought to actually protect and, quote, preserve in museums objects of archaeological and historical value literally emerging out of the ground, um, either on public or private lands. Uh, and this was happening more and more as railways and roads were being built and as agriculture was being expanded, or even during just uh, routine maintenance of people's um, people's properties. And this legislation was a way of first limiting the reuse or damage um, of metal or stone objects that were being found, um, specifically by local populations. It also was meant to staunch the flow of antiquities to foreign markets, which was happening more and more. And it was a part of a much larger colonial project of kind of creating a history of India that was um, that could be proven sort of archaeologically using these types of objects as evidence. Um, and being British, there was, of course, a bureaucratic process by which all of this should happen. Uh, the first, of course, was that any images that emerged out of the ground would first be uh, documented either in drawings. This is one of my favorite drawings here um, from 1887. Uh, so they're either drawn or later, of course, they're photographed. Um, then they're published both in English and in the vernacular press uh, so that any local claimants who could prove that these objects belong to them, and this is a whole other area of you know, craziness, um, prove that these could belong to them could appear in front of the local administrator and lodge a claim. So if the claim was verified, and here too there are a lot of problems with how claims were verified, um, claimants could either relinquish their claim and be compensated the cost of the weight, just the physical weight of either the stone or the metal. 
in which case the government museum would be notified and then could choose whether they wanted the objects or not. But if the claimants did not wish to give up their objects, the museum actually was offered to kind of make a counterclaim. So in the Treasure Trove Act already is this um, possibility of disagreeing with where these objects should go. Um, and in fact, in the 18, between the late 1800s and 1947, the year of Indian independence, we have nearly 50 petitions from local, primarily Hindu claimants, asking the museum or the Madras government or even the governor of Madras for their gods back. Um, and several British administrators were very uncomfortable with how you actually made this uh, work in, in sort of a day-to-day -day, uh, way because they had to deal with the people who were very angry and upset about their objects being taken from them. And in this case, we have the collector of Tanjawu who says, these are different categories than objects that are part of the Jain or the Buddhist tradition, which are dead religions. So if we insist on acquiring objects that are part of a living tradition, the result is only to hurt the religious feelings of the community which claims them. Um, now, there are many different arguments that are made by the local claimants as well as the museum, but I'm going to specifically look at a few arguments concerning the bodies of the gods. Um, in 1927, in Kanarikote village in southern Arkot district of the Madras presidency, the god Shiva himself emerged from the ground and began to speak to his devotees. A printed tract described the event as an extraordinary miracle and claimed that Shiva himself was, quote, appearing in several places to prove what is said in the sacred epic, the Bhagavad Gita. God apparently said, and I quote, I will appear when justice is put down by injustice to reestablish fairness, unquote. The larger injustice apparently was that Indians had come to doubt their own Hindu religion due to Western civilization's corrosive influence, but the immediate injustice was that this image of Shiva was being acquired by the government museum. The 1927 petition ends with a devotional song plea to the devotees, asking them to build a new temple where the image of Shiva can be reconsecrated and worshipped. But despite the god actually appearing himself and speaking, and the community collecting enough funds for the creation of a new temple, because of the rules of the Treasure Trove Act, the museum was allowed to acquire the bronze. Even when the gods themselves can't be fully embodied into life, whatever spectral presence they have still produce physical effects on the bodies of the living. First excavated in 1926, the site of Nagapatnam yielded some 300 Buddhist bronzes, of which over 80 were acquired by the government museum. At the time, the museum's archaeological assistant, T.N. Ramachandran, noted that, quote, he had heard several reports of the place in question, which was then a scrub-covered mound all describing it as haunted, a sanctuary in ruins, unquote. And in 1934, when bones were found at the site, rumors started to spread and were actually published in the Madras Mail newspaper that nothing had ever prospered on the site, no people, no buildings, no agriculture, and in fact that a diviner had prophesied that unless these bones were released from their obscurity, the curse on the place would never be lifted. So even crumbling bones then, um, later thought to be animal bones, not human bones, could do things to living bodies and were dangerous. But other living flesh and blood bodies are also implicated. Um, in 1939, K. Gopalakrishnan, a representative of the village of Mayavaram, wrote to the villagers Indian representative, in, uh, who was then the Minister for Public Information in the Madras government, asking about the status of some bronze images that he had promised to get returned to them. And he says, we press for the idols because they were found on our, in our village, and even though we could order another set for not very much money, we have sentimental objections to part with them. And then he says, I beg to bring to your kind notice that many of us with our wives and children had to undergo many difficulties in going to Ichanguri to vote for you. You may inquire the distance from Isakuri to Ichanguri and you may imagine the difficulties of our young children when we took their mothers to vote for you. I think it is your first duty to fight for our bronzes since you happen to represent us in the cabinet. Um, the not so veiled threat of not being reelected worked and the images were in fact returned. 
Now, the museum makes counter arguments for why these types of objects belong in the museum. But it doesn't focus on the able-bodied status of these gods, but on their mutilated bodies. Um, as seen in the previous example I just mentioned, people could actually commission new bronze images to be used in their, in their temples. It doesn't actually change their sanctity, right? Um, but they actually would rather have old objects that were still usable in worship, and this is mentioned over and over again. But in cases where they are so badly damaged that there's no possible repair, um, there are actually religious texts that say these types of images cannot be used in um, as, as places for the divine to inhabit. So they really should be deconsecrated and in some cases melted down and recast. And museum administrators are using this mutilated argument and therefore inappropriate for worship um, in a few important situations. In particular, this one, this 1936 case where Natraja found at Mela Parambulam um, was vociferously argued for by the villagers of that place. And Gravely, whose face you saw a few minutes ago, wrote to the government that the Natraja is badly broken, one leg being almost severed, um, and you'll see there's a gash here, um, and one flame broken from the Prabha. So this is broken over here. Um, it is therefore ceremonially unfit for worship, nor will it be re rendered ceremonially fit by permitting, as it is not allowed by the Shastras, the texts. Um, the Devi image, so the image of the consort next to him, cannot be worshipped apart from him. It is an unusually beautiful image, and as the two belong together as a single set, both should be acquired. Um, so not only is the individual god unfit, the consort is unfit. Without him, a sort of two-for-one argument. Now, this case has extensive negotiations with the bronzes first being awarded back to the village by the Madras government's revenue department, at which point Gravely writes an angry letter to the revenue department asking if they have any idea what they're doing. Quote, I must respectfully ask government to consider whether the interests of local claimants are really of greater importance than is securing for a public institution in the interest of the culture and the whole nation invaluable materials for the study of Indian art and archaeology, such as cannot otherwise be obtained. Uh, so with the burden of standing for all of Indian art and art history, these bronzes then came to the museum. But this mutilation and replacement argument also received spirited rejoinders from several local claimants. Um, this is probably one of my favorites. Um, following a series of testy exchanges about the acquisition of mutilated and unserviceable bronzes from the temple at Sri Rangam, the head of their religious board wrote to Gravely in July 1933 that he couldn't possibly give them these uh, objects because, quote, we have a museum of our own in the temple to preserve all of the old unserviceable idols. So how many bronzes did the museum actually acquire against Indian protest? Um, Gravely's tally in 1936 suggests that only one out of 44 disputed bronzes came to the museum in the years between 1921 and 1936. This does not account for the many objects for which there were either no local challenges against acquisition or those which were dismissed as um, not having a verifiable claim. And by the 1930s, the museum's bronzes, Buddhist, Jain, and Hindu, had increased from three, the ones that you saw, saw um, on the staircase, to over 300 in a matter of just uh, two or three decades. So how do we actually then care for all of this stuff? Now, in their original contexts, the care of religious things is both physical and ritual, one, ritual in quotes, one could say, and carried out in both public and private. Um, Hindu bronzes, for example, are physically cared for by religious practitioners who wash, dress, anoint, and prepare them for public view. And the offering of prayers and viewing by religious devotees is, of course, also a kind of care because constant maintenance is required to keep living things alive. But once things enter the museum, what kind of care do they need? In fact, the language of the archive changes quite a bit here for religious objects once they're in the care of the museum, moving from references to bodies to descriptions of material, so specifically metal and bone. And we keep hearing about them being kept or stored rather than used, and this is not unfamiliar to us, right? Um, we also begin to see the mention of 
quote unquote, scientific care for museum objects. Terms like chemical conservation and archeological chemistry are used to describe the kinds of interventions that need to be made on museum objects. Um, and this is around the same time that similar terms are in use in the key museums with conservation facilities in Europe and North America. We might be tempted to construct some sort of binary of indigenous religious care versus museological scientific care, but as I'd like to suggest, or rather as the archive suggests, things are of course far more complicated. In 1892, Alexander Rea, working for the Archaeological Survey of India, excavated the third century BCE stupa at the site of Bhattiprolu. His publication, of which I show you some images here, reproduces drawings of three stone caskets found at various depths at the site, each of which contained smaller inner caskets that held gold foil flowers, a hexagon inscribed in Brahmi script, and human bones. So here are some, um, these are some of the little flowers. These are all gold foil, and these are the caskets. Um, confusingly named. Um, so Sir John Marshall, uh, uh, excuse me. So, one of the bone fragments, perhaps a relic of the Buddha himself, um, and if you can see here, this is one of the caskets, and inside it, there's a sort of dotted line here. This is this object. It, it's described as a crystal file, but it was a, a, some kind of rock crystal reliquary that was then placed inside here, and inside this crystal reliquary was a fragment of human bone, and that's what you see shown um, sort of looking into the vessel. So one of these bone fragments, this one in particular, perhaps a relic of the Buddha himself, was found in this crystal reliquary. Um, obviously very carefully packed. It was in sort of three boxes. Um, so here you see that some care was taken to make sure that this object survived, or this relic of perhaps the Buddha himself, survived. Um, in the museum records, it's described as a, quote, small piece of bone contained in a rock crystal case. And it was transferred to the government museum in 1892, where it remained in storage for 24 years until its return was requested by the Mahabodhi Society, a Buddhist community in Calcutta, for, uh, where they planned to build a temple. Um, Sir John Marshall, um, the head of the Archaeological Survey of India at the time, was in favor of returning the relic, particularly as he seemed to think that the museum was not taking very good care of it. In a letter he wrote in 1916, he said, quote, I asked to see it when I was in Madras and found it tucked away in a safe, I think, in an empty cigarette tin. Museum Superintendent Henderson told me that nowadays it's never shown to anyone, and I imagine, therefore, that no special value is attached to it, and that the museum would be quite glad for it to be returned to the Buddhists. Such relics, indeed, are devoid of interest from the museum point of view, and moreover, for sentimental reasons, ought not to be exhibited in a museum. So not only was the relic not stored in the way that it should, but in a strange way, it wasn't being offered the veneration that it should be, i.e. not being shown to anyone. Now Henderson re agrees to the return of the relic, but you can imagine he chafed a little bit at Marshall's characterization of the museum's care, and he writes back and he says, Sir John Marshall is incorrect in supposing that the relic was kept in an empty cigarette tin. It has never, since it first came to my care, been preserved in anything else other than the crystal reliquary in which it was originally found, and this reposes by itself in a drawer of a safe. Um, he must have understood me, for he states that I told him that nowadays it is never shown to anyone. I have informed him that it is rarely brought out of the safe and only to show to the more important visitors in the museum. Instead of attaching no special value to the relic, I have always regarded it as the most important object in the museum. Interesting. Um, four years later, this relic then was sent to Calcutta, but not in its crystal reliquary. Instead, it was placed in a new kind of reliquary, a <laughs> small tin box um, <laughs> wrapped in tissue paper, which itself was packed in a strong double box lined with cotton wool and insured for 2,000 rupees. Pretty big sum. Now, why did the casket not go with it when it was so intimately connected with the relic itself and had been for 2,000 years? Marshall of the Archaeological Survey had apparently ordered that the reliquary be kept behind because of its, quote, archaeological value. A very confusing reversal of logic if, as we saw in the case of the Natraja and the consort, things that stay together because of their sanctity should presumably remain together. Um, but Marshall didn't want the relic to go 
casket lists, and in an astonishing correspondence, um, we get to see that there were attempts to make a copy of this crystal reliquary in Madras, in Calcutta, and eventually in London, where copies of this reliquary were made in plaster, possibly gold, and eventually in rock crystal. So it was that the care of the museum allowed for a relic of the Buddha to be reinterred by the Buddhist community in a London-made casket copying an ancient rock crystal reliquary. Now, unlike bone reliquaries, however, the large number of bronzes now in the government museum were taking up significant space. And in 1923, with Superintendent Gravely at the helm, the bronzes were given dedicated exhibition space in three galleries, a small gallery for Buddhist bronzes and two larger ones, um, one dedicated to images associated with the god Shiva and one with the god Vishnu. So these are all the, this is the plan for all of the cases for the Shaivite image gallery and these for all of the images associated with Vishnu. Um, the design for these galleries was a sort of temple in itself, with massive teakwood cases going nine and a half feet in height, coated in gleaming black varnish, and with cases that had large glass panes so that the images could be seen up close. And when Gravely initially submitted the request to the revenue department, they always seem to get in the way of everything, they remarked that it was the cost of a house, um, but eventually they did approve it. Once built and fully installed with bronzes, the galleries had an extraordinary effect on visitors. Um, and this is, I don't believe these are the original um, cases, but I show you my father and my children were very annoyed to be there that day um, for scale, but it may have be based on what these cases initially looked like. But once built and fully installed with bronzes, the galleries had such an extraordinary effect on visitors. In 1938, after winning the appeal for the removal of objects from the village of Kaveri Pakam against the will of its residents, quote, archeological assistant, Mr. Shivaramamurthy took the cart drivers from Kaveri Pakam, so they had had to drive their things to the museum. He took them into the galleries where they exclaimed that the museum was like heaven, all the gods being there, and that of course their sculptures ought to be there too. Um, and noticing that all of these images were labeled in English, Tamil, and Telugu, the villagers of Kaveri Pakam wanted their own contribution acknowledged and demanded a plaque be put up stating that they had donated their objects to the museum. Now, in addition to making space for bronze images that entered the museum, these glass cases were meant to encase them and protect them from the salt-laden marine atmosphere of the city of Madras, and today we would call this preventive conservation. But it was soon very clear that the material of the bronze itself was changing, and if you look here, you can see these sort of pustules that have broken out on this bronze. Um, and this worrying physical change impacted not only the physical appearance of the bronze, but threatened the monetary value of the bronze collection, which the revenue department um, was very clear had grown significantly since Hindu bronzes suddenly started to be seen as having um, important artistic merit. Um, and given that physical intervention seemed necessary, the Madras government, of course, sought out the cheapest option, overruling gravely and others who insisted on some kind of scientific treatment being undertaken. The government advertised instead for the services of a traditional bronze caster with this rather surprising and confusing call for applicants. Um, they asked specifically for, for bronze casters. These are people who cast new bronze images with a special knowledge of the preservation of bronze images and who will do this work and yet maintain the green patina. And this, of course, tells you that within a museum context, green patina, of course, is important as evidence of age and authenticity. But the, to the bronze caster, this is evidence of damage and lack of maintenance. And in fact, only four applicants came in. Um, some of them may have been coerced. And none of them was actually suitable for the task of preservation. And in fact, during my field work in India, and this is the, the same sun you saw earlier, a really long time ago, um, I took a copy of this advertisement to several bronze casters in Swami Malay, where some workshops can actually claim to have been casting bronzes for over a thousand years. And the general reaction to the advertisement was one of amusement and befuddlement. Um, 
The government museum eventually hired a chemist, Ram Singh Ahuja, who over the course of a year identified that almost 300 bronzes were suffering from what he described as a contagious disease that was spreading by degrees and was converting bronze into amorphous whitish green powder, a creeping or malignant patina. Um, today we would refer to this as bronze disease, a corrosion product commonly associated with active um, salts present in copper alloys. But at the time, Ahuja's approach was simply to remove this sort of surface material, but within a year of his work, the whitish green powder returned again. And it seemed that the bronzes were coming back to life, or at the very least, getting sick again. Um, so this raised the awareness that the treatment of bronzes might not be a one-time intervention, but might actually require ongoing care. And as you can imagine, the revenue department was displeased. Um, in 1930, more than a decade after Gravely had first started noticing signs of bronze disease on objects, he wrote to inform the Madras government that he had hired a, quote, whole-time chemist to preserve the bronzes. That man, as Parmashivan shown here, had actually never worked on museum objects before this job, but he was a chemist and a physicist and actually was trained under Nobel Prize winner in physics, C.V. Raman. You might have heard of the Raman effect or why is the Mediterranean Sea blue? Um, he was, of course, a very quick study. He had to be because there were at least 300 bronzes requiring his care. And he laid out three major treatment priorities. First, he was going to remove the damaging incrustations, which concealed the decorative details, the inscriptions, the accoutrements that um, these different gods were holding to aid with sort of research and um, a better understanding of who these gods were. He also wanted to eliminate the corrosive substances which were causing this problem. And third, and most daringly, to restore objects to their original appearance. Um, so he did not propose to keep the green patina previously seen as desirable. Instead, he promised to almost alchemically return corrosion to metal again. Well, okay, chemically, not alchemically. Um, and this was possible because of the development of a new technique called electrolytic reduction, a technique already in use um, to treat archeological bronzes in European and North American museums. And unlike the previous work done by Ram Singh Ahuja, who was just removing things from the surface, this treatment chemically reduces corrosion products back to elemental copper. And as you can see from this image, um, it had pretty spectacular results. But this work was not simply that of copying what was happening in the scientific epicenters of the West. Um, he worked on a scale unthinkable outside India, conserving large numbers of bronzes ranging several feet in height. And he did so in a city with an unreliable electrical supply. It's called electrolytic reduction. Um, and in 19, by 1936, he had designed and built a custom-built temple to electrolytic reduction. This new laboratory, I think you yeah, might probably not, it says archaeological chemistry on the side. Um, and as I look at the plan, so here's the plan for this, this space, um, it strikes me that these spaces with the, these different functions, uh, you know, imagining bronzes sort of moving around in these spaces makes me think of them wandering a new kind of temple precinct as they go from one part of the building to another over the course of their treatment. So let's look a little bit at what this treatment is like. So everything begins here with the electrolytic cells. And these are these large tanks. Um, and bronzes were first immersed in these tanks that were filled with a 2% sodium hydroxide solution. And the accession numbers and the information about the objects were written on the side because, of course, the objects are immersed inside and you can't see them. Um, these tanks are attached with these rather frightening looking wires um, to an electrical uh, unit that was attached to something in this control panel room. Um, and presumably this light bulb went on when electricity was flowing. Um, and they were also, the, the reason why even electricity was possible was because there was this motor generator in another room. And I, you know, I'm not really sure why they needed even this, this light bulb, because from the descriptions of people who actually worked in this laboratory, the, the equipment was so no noisy and literally vibrated the entire building that it was often quite clear when something was happening. Um, this equipment was in use six days a week, all day. And I imagine Dr. Paramashivan very stoically, you know, sort of stealing himself against the cacophony of the equipment and inspecting these tanks. 
because the tanks needed watching, because the bronzes, of course, are inside them. And they're, of course, very different in terms of their characteristics, their size, their corrosion. And there was no sort of set standard time for how long this, these treatments had to occur. So watching the tanks for the slowing of the bubbles being produced and responding to occasional explosions, yes, explosions are listed in the logs, was really a full-time job. Now, there are two aspects of this treatment that I think are particularly important to point out. Um, one is that the removal of corrosion from the bronzes was a kind of scientific mar marvel, right? A kind of touchless car wash, right? Touchless cleaning process in which science did all the work. And there was a seemingly objective type of cleaning devoid of all of the fallibility of the human hand. But some human intervention was necessary because the material itself resisted a simple cleaning. Um, these bronzes, of course, were very heavy. Most of them are solid cast, so they are massive. They're hard to even get in and out of these tanks. And when they're submerged in their tanks, the weight, um, especially on the underside of these bases, displaces the electrolyte underneath them. So there would be air pockets underneath the bases where none of this wonderful touchless cleaning was going on. And this was very frustrating, as you can imagine. Um, and Parmashivan came up with a really extraordinary way to deal with this. Now, we might call this extremely interventive today, but I actually find it an incredible way to think about a kind of cultural response to a, a scientific problem. He actually began to cut holes in the bases of these sculptures, but he didn't just cut them any place. He actually cut them mimicking cast-in holes made by ancient bronze casters. And what these holes are used for is to allow these images to be carried in procession. And I find this quite an interesting way to deal with what was a very kind of you know, problematic um, scientific thing that he was dealing with over and over again. Now, the electrolytic process could be relatively short, a few days or a few months. And here I'm just showing you, um, here's the, the control panel that managed uh, all of the, the events happening in the electrolytic cells. And here's the scary motor generator, which had to be bolted down because it vibrated so much it often bounced into the next room, brightening. Um, once the cleaning was over, and as I said, could be a few days, could even be months, uh, the bronzes were taken out of the tanks and taken to the washing room where Mr. Arokyaswamy here um, would scrub the, quote, greenish sludge that covered them until he recovered a metallic surface. Um, once dry, the bronzes were then coated with wax until they shone and were ready for exhibition. I'm struck by the similarity between these images and the kinds of ritual care that takes place within the Hindu temple context, the bathing, the washing, the anointing, the coating, and eventually the public veneration of these images. The archives record nothing of either Mr. Aroki Swami's or Dr. Parmashivan's responses to treating the gods beyond technical notes. Were they gods or just materials to them or something in between? What is definitely clear, though, is that his insistence on further studying the material characteristics of the bronzes um, was what he did in this space called the analytical laboratory. And I believe it's in this space that he and my grandfather would have met and worked. And it's also where he began to identify that all materials in the museum collection needed care, not just bronzes, but stone, pottery, leather, wood, ivory, anything. And not just a single intervention, and here's his long list of things that need intervention. Um, but these require perpetual care and maintenance, just like living things. Um, this was something that gravely came to support after initial reluctance. And it took him many, many letters to argue with the Madras government about the need for a skilled archaeological chemist as long as the museum existed. Um, it only took 10 years to make him a perfect permanent staff member. But he says that. This will be required as long as the museum exists. And now I'd like to ask, why do museums need to exist at all? Now, one of the joys of looking at a museum in India is that unlike museums in Europe and North America at this time, there is an expectation that brown bodies will be in there, not as specimens themselves, but as visitors. And despite the colonial infrastructure, the colonial museum in India is full of real Indian people doing real human things. And the archives preserve some snippets of these people's stories that feel achingly familiar and poignant. Visitors complained about the toilets and the poor food service. 
Uh, one boy stole a small bronze, but it was found out and his father was fined. Someone broke into the museum through a skylight and stole one of those gold flowers from Patiprolu and came back the next day to the scene of the crime to boast and then got caught. Um, a couple was found hastily rearranging their clothing after an amorous escapade behind the glass case of uh, the god Shiva, something that the god himself would likely have approved of. So, in part the fact that the government museum was a space where these bodies regularly inhabited and did things, um, to me is really kind of exciting and joyful. And part of it, of course, is that the museum was a free institution, something that Gravely campaigned very hard to maintain. And all sorts of people came. School children and their teachers, the poor, the illiterate, large family units, college students, and Muslim women, for whom there was a special day set aside with only female guards supervising the exhibits. And they especially came on holiday, specifically the festival day of Kanupongal, a harvest festival typically celebrated in January. And I just give you a sort of smattering of um, statistics. This is uh, incomplete for all of the years that I'm interested in. But just to show you, on a single day, you might have at least 79,000 people show up to the museum, staggering amount. Um, and this, this remains fairly consistent, I would say, until the early 1940s. Now, during the 1935 visit of Markham and Hargraves, who were writing a book called The Museums of India, they observed on Kanupungal Day that at Madras, on the occasion of one of the great feasts, no less than 130,000 people trooped in, an orderly, happy crowd with a piece of string stretched, where a piece of string stretched across a passage could divert and restrain. And although the interior of the museum was packed and produced the inevitable accompaniment of fingered glass, betel nut spit, and dirty marks on the wall, one realized that this was one of the surest ways of interpreting the outside world to the masses of India. Now, despite the racist and patronizing language used here, um, there is no discounting the interest of museum visitors, whatever they might be getting out of being in these spaces. And long before the departments of museum education or community engagement exists, uh, existed as they typically do now in our museums, the administrators of the government museum sought to have their collections have effects on visitors. But here's where the collection exerted unpredictable influences. Because things unencumbered by glass cases do their own kinds of outreach in unsettling ways. What, for example, did museum visitors make of sitting in the lecture series conducted by Superintendent J.R. Henderson, who in 1916 began to show glass plate negatives, and here's piece of equipment, uh, glass plate negatives of objects projected on an eight foot wide calico sheet in the museum theater. What must, it have been, what must it have felt like to see the gods you knew in real life looming over you, diaphanous, drained of color, and projected in a shadowy beam of light? And what did museum visitors make of disembodied voices that seemed to arise from objects themselves? Because in 1947, Superintendent Ayyappan prepared the first audio tour of the museum. Quote, as an experimental measure, a gramophone record was made in Tamil of the special exhibition on corals. This record was played to a small group of visitors, and their reactions were carefully watched by me and the scientific staff. A little creepy. Um, but he proposed gramophone records to be installed first in the archaeological and Hindu sculpture exhibits with information played in intervals in Telugu, Tamil, and Malayalam. And unfortunately, this didn't come to pass, but they did actually get to the drafting stage where they decided where the gramophone would go and where the speaker would go. So, you can imagine this possibility of spirit voices leaving museum cases and entering the galleries in curious ways. And if the spectral presences and voices of gods begin to move again, um, as the processional bronzes themselves one did, the gods have a new bodily presence because of one of the most important developments in any museum, the gift shop. Um, I love this sign that says, explanations will help you begin with these. I need, I need that you know, for my life. Um, but displayed not just for viewing, but for actual purchase, and these boxes here, are postcards of the gods in the museum, available certainly by 1936. They were originally intended to make masterpieces of the museum known to broader audiences, um, but they were also supposed to be cheap mementos of visits, 
but priced at one anna each, these images were likely beyond the purchasing power of most of the poorer visitors, but the revenue from postcard sales in the 1930s and 40s suggests that on average between 1,200 and 2,000 postcards were sold annually, and I would imagine probably functioned as portable devotional images of once portable devotional images. Um, in fact, these postcards and other museum publications were even recommended for sale outside the museum, um, gravely suggested asking book booksellers, Monsieur Higginbotham and company, to quote, set apart a small corner in every one of their railway stalls for museum publications and pictures to attract the attention of people. So in this way, perhaps the gods might have visited the places they had come from, um, perhaps inhabiting those spaces again and blessing the assembled devotees on the railway platforms with their presence. So why is this stuff that happens in a museum in colonial Madras relevant today? For me, living with this archive of voices has made much clearer the fact that museums have a certain way of functioning. And if we're willing to acknowledge it, there's a surprising arbitrariness to our categories, our decisions, and our regimes of care. It's also led me to think much more empathetically about the stuff in our collections, because as these stories from Southern India from nearly a century ago show us, the things in museums are not just things. They are living, dead, and somewhere in between. And even when they're things, they're people's things. They came from somewhere, from someone who used and lived with them and cared for them. Um, and because even under circumstances stances such as in southern India where local claimants have a process for resisting the museum's acquisition of, pro of objects, there is in the archives a profound awareness of the sense of loss for these communities um, in the name, of course, of the museum's gain. And I'm therefore struck by the regularity with which we justify separations in our collection as a form of care, removing things from their communities, from the objects they were once with, and even relieving of their corrosion as, ma as matter-of-factly as we do. Now, the sense of loss from removal, I think, is all more heavy in colonial collections, but I would argue in many collections where the museum's ability to collect relies on a power imbalance that reinforces a certain regimen of categorization, display, care, and use over indigenous ones. So one aspect of looking at museum stuff is to really acknowledge the pain that they might represent and the ways that certain connections between people and their past have been severed through the museum's intervention. But as we've seen, the status of things in the museum is unsettled. And a closer look at what it, what is, what's possible in our collections um, is really warranted. Um, I was wearing a half-face respirator and breathing heavily, sort of like an Indian Darth Vader, when I saw something in the archives that made me think I was hallucinating. Now, this wasn't that much out of the realm of possibility because I'd been having physical symptoms from reading the documents because they'd been fumigated with the chemical paradichlorobenzene, um, the legacy of a Western conservation treatment introduced perhaps in the 1950s and replacing a local tradition of using insect repellent um, herbs on documents because I'd seen a very familiar name in a museum report from 1942, and here it is. Uh, it thanks. Um, this Mr. K.P.S. Nyer, a chemist and metallurgist in the railway. Now, this was very confusing to me because I knew the name as my grandfather. What's he doing in, this, what's he doing in my archive, right? With a little additional research, it became clear that he'd actually been working with Paramashivan, whom you've seen quite a bit of, in a decade-long collaboration, that they'd been visiting each other's laboratories, I think, and certainly were working on publications together. And the metallographic cross-sections, here you see uh, the negative, um, and then here you see the, the printed version. I believe these were actually made in my grandfather's metallurgical laboratory at the Madras and South Maratha Railways, and here you can see him outside his office. Um, and though none of my family members was aware that my grandfather was doing his work, my great aunt, who lived with my grandparents as a child, recalled that she'd been brought along to the museum on multiple occasions. And I imagine her rolling her eyes in boredom the way that my own children do whenever I say we're going to the museum. Um, as I was a young child when my grandfather died, my memories of him are, as an old, are, are of him as an old man. But the archives brought him back to me in his vigorous 30s and 40s in glorious knee stocks, alive again. And perhaps this is the reason why the stuff of our collections is worth engaging with more closely, because they're not dead and gone, but they might temporarily come back to us, alive, or in somewhat more haunting ways. Because the power of stuff is not that it's just stuff, like a dejuiced exoskeleton stifled under glass, 
The power of stuff is in imagining that it might be capable of regularly escaping its glass case, one hairy, twitching limb at a time. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, there's so many generative questions that um, this discussion brought, but one of the things that uh, I'm quite interested in, and I'm going to draw maybe sort of an oblique line, um, but I, I was particularly interested in the the particularity of uh, religious uh, objects within this collection and the idea of religious objects being living things in particular because they have um, sort of vernacular uh, practices and uh, sort of uh, uh, resonances. And I want to kind of connect this particular case with the contemporary applications or um, legal aspects of NAGPRA and how NAGPRA is utilizing this kind of, this, this same kind of logic that these are living um, objects or they have purposes beyond kind of a collecting purpose. And I, I think one of the things that um, that struck me to, to make this particular connection was uh, the idea of, you know, the repatriation debate um, as we look at it now. Uh, one of the things I studied in my master's was, or wrote about was kind of the difference between the repatriation debate and say the case of the Cohen or Diamond, which has its own, I guess, narrative kind of folklore and all these kind of mythologies around it versus, uh, let's say, the uh, Tipu's tiger in the VNA collection, which is considered a curio object. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the religious object kind of falls outside of those two categories. Uh, they're not sort of, it's not sort of like a precious uh, metal, but it's not a curio and it has this kind of special place. And I think NAGPRA is a, an interesting kind of link in contemporary applications of how that, that kind of gets mobilized. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've really seen how NAGPRA is used specifically for Indian religious objects. But I think what's really interesting to me about this kind of contemporary moment in, I think, museum studies in particular, is that we're realizing that there are all of these other ways in which these things functioned, um, and it's so limiting to think of you know, just this one knowledge system that values these kinds of things a certain way. Um, and I don't, I don't really know how we can change that except for case by case, object by object. Um, because it, it's too simplistic to say we should, you know, repatriate all this or we should send all this back because too much has happened. Uh, and there's so many complexities and there are really some, to me, very devastating ways in which this kind of, this cultural heritage or these things have, have really been devalued or damaged through this kind of scientific or museological care. So I think we have to really, you know, do some truth telling and acknowledge the fact that, you know, we've we've caused irreparable harm. But that doesn't mean that there aren't possibilities of moving forward. But I think that really has to be done object by object, you know, community member by community community member. And to me that's the most sustainable way and, and frankly the most meaningful way. Just a quick question. What kind of museum do you curate? What, what kind of um, bodies, artifacts, objects? So currently, I actually, uh, I'm the associate director of the Hopkins Archaeological Museum, and it's mostly archaeological material from Greece, Rome, um, Egypt, uh, some Near Eastern material, and also some Ancient Americas material. And I think, you know, doing the work with such a particular archive has made me look at our collection very differently. Um, because we don't have this kind of paper trail that says this came from this place, or this even belonged to this person. But it doesn't mean that those questions aren't relevant to think about. So, you know, I, I mean, I've seen these objects in our collection so many times, and, and now I really think about, well, whose, you know, whose pot was that? Or how, how do we kind of try to re retrace um, the steps by which this object came here. And the most recent project that I, I did that I find, you know, just has been incredibly powerful for me to have been part of is um, actually recreating the faces of two ancient Egyptian bodies, so human beings, um, in our care. And they've really had some quite, you know, horrendous things happen to them, again, in the name of, 
normal collecting practices and care in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And part of the project was to use some of the technologies that we have available to us to kind of recover a little bit of their identities. And to me, one of the proudest things that I've, I've ever done and probably will ever do in my um, career is rediscovering the name of one of these individuals that was hidden uh, on, on the coffin, but actually with just the right kind of um, examination technique, we recovered her name. And to me, that's incredibly satisfying. Thank you. I actually have two questions. Uh, one, I always thought when uh, a bronze gets a patina, the corrosive process stops. But obviously, the salt affects the bronze differently, mm -hmm. and the uh, electrolytic process cons conservation has to be done. If you could enlighten me a little bit more on that, and also the care, because like we, we have a, a bronze statue right at the entrance here of the museum that's uh, completely blackened. You know, but I assume that it's a bronze, and I, I guess that's waxed or taken care of it properly. Also, now this is a little bit weird, but the yeah, spider. I spiders. So. Yeah, well, this is about the spider. <laughs> uh, you know, I think it's Pocleotheria. Okay. I, I don't know. All right. Is that named after Edgar Allan Poe? Because no, the gold not. bug. Because he describes the, the spider, the bug, as a very shimmering, shiny thing. And there's so many things that are connected with Poe that are, uh, I'm going to have to look this up, but I thought you might No, know. it's, I think, uh, it's named after someone named Pocock, Pocock, um, who was working in southern India and actually identified that in a town called Guti, and he found it because it had just either killed or horribly maimed a child. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a happy spider. Yep. Um, Regarding the patina question, I mean, this is where language is, you know, it's really important and it's also very confusing the way some of these terms are used. So if you're thinking about patina as an intentional change to a metal surface, this is what, you know, people like bronze casters and artists who work in bronze do on purpose. They actually change the coloration of, um, a, a, you know, a, a metal alloy surface on purpose. And they do this by usually heating it with some chemical that's applied. And you can get a huge variety of colorations, like a black bronze, for example. This is a, these are very kind of um, important patinas that we know were used in ancient Greece and in ancient Egypt to create, you know, specific visual effects. But when things get collected, this term patina is used very differently as a desirable um, you know, evidence of age. So if it's a nice looking green, which is essentially a corrosion product, um, in the literature in the early 1900s, it's described as an edel or enameled patina. But if it's not attractive and it's got all of these bumps, then it's a malignant patina. So these are just, you know, you have to know who's actually applying those terms. But if we're talking about patina as an intentional surface um, change, then usually we're talking about when it was actually made. But if we're talking about patina later on after it's been excavated, for example, that usually refers to unintentional corrosion. And really, if these images are meant to inhabit, have you know, the divine presence inhabit them, they should never be marred in any way. They should be gleaming and as perfect as possible. Hi. Hi. That was marvelous. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering about the astonishing number of people that came through the museum at uh, the earlier times. And if, so my first question was um, about, do you believe that even like, so I realized that Pongal is a festival harvest time. Do you believe that some people were coming through um, more in a, in the vein of worshiping as opposed to as museum viewers? Or is it possible that literally, like, museum experience would be more akin to, say, someone coming into Penn Museum normally? And then I have a short thing to tell you. Okay. Um, well, it's amazing the amount of statistics that the museum gathered because the revenue department was always very interested in how many people are using this resource. Um, and actually, the administrators are very frustrated with what people are doing in the museum. Um, and there are two buildings. So the building that I showed you um, has the bronzes and what might, one might call the more kind of historical things. And then the other building has all of the, you know, the um, taxidermied animals and the snakes and you know 
kind of interesting, weird, cool stuff. And in the early part of the museum's history, there was actually a zoological garden in the museum. So you could come and you could watch the python eat you know, rats. Uh, and the, the museum administrators are very frustrated because more people wanted to go see the animals and you know, see these creepy things than to see these things that were of such significant archaeological value. And they're actually, for a while, statistics broken down by who goes to the kind of historic and artistic exhibits and who goes to you know, all of that other stuff, the products. Um, but you know, people, it was a free place to go. It was an open space to go. There were very few open spaces in urban Madras where you could go without really being policed. There's the beach. Um, there was People's Park. But other than that, where could people go? And, and we know that Madras, certainly by the early 20th century, is this place that's getting all of these migrant workers from all over southern India. And they are living, you know, in some cases, in really horrendous conditions. And so when they have a day off, um, this is where they come. And in fact, the museum attempts to adjust its, its schedule so that people who have to work all day could potentially come to the museum at 6 AM. So the museum was open at 6 AM for quite some time to allow people to come in. Um, and it's open you know, even on days when people wanted the day off the staff kind of strikes, saying you know, we don't want to work on Sundays. But again, they're told they have to come in because this is when people can come. Um, we see some changes in the visitorship when other kinds of entertainments are available. So when the talkies come in, when movies are available, significant portions of the visitors drop off, but they're the ones who could afford the talkies. So we still have these you know, large groups who can only come in for free. When the aquarium opens, um, again, people who can afford the aquarium go there. And when the zoological garden leaves the museum and actually becomes its own space in People's Park, again, there's a sort of frustration that people are now going to that a living museum rather than coming to this other place. Um, but it really changes. And I think it's just such an important sort of place where people could assume they could come under any circumstances. And I think it's something that we should think about a lot for our own museums, that you're expected to be here. You're not just invited, that you're expected to be here and it's your space. And you had something to say. Um, so we had a, I guess, collector keeper early on in the East Asian collections here at the museum who, uh, Somerville, I hope I'm getting this right, my colleagues will help me, correct me if I'm getting it wrong. Um, and he definitely set up the East Asian collections to be worshipped. So he had kind of a temple situation and he used to come in kimonos and um, he himself would sort of officiate <laughs> or sort of stand by and visitors from Eastern Asia and different parts of the world would come and, you know, worship um, within the space. And I always thought it was a fascinating topic for someone to write about. That's all. Well, and I think we do this a, a lot more in museum spaces where we actually finally are saying to, you know, community members who claim those objects, these are, these are yours too. Please come and, you know, engage with your ancestors. You know, the, this, these are your ancestors as well. Um, one thing I'll say is, you know, from having hung around the museum for several months um, and, you know, looking at these archives, there were these stories that people would kind of tell me very anecdotally, like the guy who comes every year at a certain time and goes and gives some offerings to this one particular bronze that's from his village because he feels like, you know, the reason why he's living such a good life is because of this one image. So he would apparently come every year. Um, there are stories of people pressing, you know, kumkumum, um, vermilion onto glass cases uh, or leave, you know, flowers, jasmine flowers in the galleries, which are, of course, quickly sort of cleaned up. But I think people have very different relationships to these exhibits. And I, for me personally, I think that's, that's a really wonderful thing. No, thank you. Thank you very much for this. I'm curious what what you know or what the the museum tried to find out of what now is called something like a knowledge base. In other words, how aware do you think the kind of mass visitors were that they were seeing an old thing? I mean, do these see these as history tokens in the way that, you know, I as an archaeologist slash you know, aesthete raised on the National Gallery knows its renaissance. Mm -hmm. What is the, does it have a temporal or trans-temporal character? Do you, 
do you know this 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 effort to sort of give people the little education tape podcast right. before it's time is interesting. Well, I mean, it's interesting considering how many anthropologists or ethnologists were involved in the museum. They never really asked these questions of the visitors. And instead, what we have are really a lot of voices of you know white museum administrators basically pounding on about how we need to show these Indians their history because they, they can't figure it out themselves. And um, the Indian Museum, the sort of you know, shrine of museums in, in Calcutta actually released a report, I think it was 1912 or 1913, and it's, the, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to read some of these things now, but, you know, one, one sort of has to press on. But they say something like, well, there's just no hope for these people, especially for these illiterates, because, you know, the best we can do is sort of provide them this kind of curiosity case. Uh, and, and there's just this sense that there, there's simply nothing there for them intellectually or, I don't know, emotionally or anything at all. Uh, and we see this repeated over and over again in a lot of these reports on museum engagement, if you want to call it that. But part of the reason why I love Frederick Gravely so much, having never met him, and, you know, I really don't know very much about him, um, but part of what I really love about him is one of the things that he says in um, the sort of opening speech of the new Hindu gallery, so where you saw that gift shop behind him was the new Hindu galleries that opened in 1939, is he says that the job of the museum is to just give people an opportunity to take an intelligent look at the world around them. And to me, that's the most sort of, you know, basic description of what, what I think we should be, to give you a chance to simply look around and to assume that you will take an intelligent look, um, or at least give you the option to do so. Um, but for the most part, there's very little sort of feedback. We only have, we have guest books, for example, that list how many people came in so if people could sign their names, they would sign their names or else they would just do a, a thumbprint and it would be noted that you know, this person was illiterate. But there's, there's no kind of, you know, suggestion box that I found anyway. And I would really love to see that, except for, you know, when they write angry letters. And that's a <laughs> you know, whole other thing. So you were able to work in the museum now, in the current day. And um, I accept all the criticisms of the colonial structure. How did things change when the management passed on to Indian hands? And how is it today, as far as in the museum interface with the populace? Um, to be honest, that wasn't really the focus of what I was looking at the archives for. Um, in some ways, I was, I was really interested in how the museum got set up in the, in the way that it was. Uh, and I think it's, you know, I, I feel a great deal of empathy for my Indian colleagues because they're really dealing, certainly in a place like, you know, urban Chennai, why would people go to museums? And I think this is something that we are always challenged with even here, right? Why do people go there when they could go to the movies? They could go to a restaurant. They could do almost anything. What, what is, you know, drawing them here? And yet, just by hanging around in the museum, you still see people come through, as one does in any museum, and someone's excited. The kids are running from thing to thing. There are, you know, people pointing things out. And to me, there's a potential there. But unfortunately, you know, there are so many other issues to address that it's really hard to say that you know, this museum needs to have all of the resources that it really needs. And I think this is something we struggle with here as well. Um, but I would say that, you know, to me, that they've done so much work to kind of um, resuscitate the museum. The images that I showed you of the, the entrance hall with the staircase, that's relatively recently opened. And you know, for the longest time, it wasn't open. I couldn't even see it. They wouldn't let me in because there was construction going on. And to actually be able to go in and have this sort of moment in this place, to me, is very reassuring that there's still something here question is how do we actually harness that and make it relevant to people today? Why do we, how can we make the argument that this place is worth your time and, and really you're not, not very much money, it's still very affordable. And this is something that, you know, I think we're all trying to work out. Thank you, Juliana. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Hi, this is going to sound like probably a can of worms and probably outside of your general expertise, and please bear with me. I'm obviously very long-winded, as you can tell. Um, we're, they're building a telescope in Hawaii on top of the mountain Mount Kea, and it's going to be about 100 feet across. It's actually under construction. And in this story, I have a fictionalized version of things where they were su sued by the native Hawaiians because that mountain itself is considered alive and sacred to them. They don't want any foreign objects, especially like a telescope on top. However, that's like the best place in the world for the telescope scope to be, and being as that's the best place for it to be, we're going to win that argument. And so in my story, they at least negotiate with the Native Hawaiians, saying that this is the last telescope we're going to put there, and we'll, you know, basically anything we try to remove stuff off the top, we understand it's sacred to you. So they're at least respecting their understanding of things, even though they're going to, you know, th if they really want to, they could just run roughshod over it anyway. But I don't know how we, in cases where it's an object where you just return to the people that have it, it's one thing. But in this case, it sounds like it's a more difficult argument to make because it's the only place on the earth to put that telescope, but the mountain itself is sacred. So they'd rather be put somewhere else. If there was somewhere else to put it, they would do that, but that's the only place you're saying. So I don't know how we can negotiate in that kind of circumstance where it, it's like, it's like, how do you fight both sides have a valid claim to something. So I don't know what you would recommend. You may be that, again, in my story, there really is no good answer, and it could be there isn't any good answer in those cases. Yeah, unfortunately, I feel like we're, you know, we, we get so far down the path before any negotiation or actual conversation begins that it's almost sort of a, a done deal, and then you have a bunch of lawsuits. Um, this is unfortunately the way things have been set up. And I think part of what I'm very um, concerned about is that there's still very much this imbalance of power, right? Who gets to make the decisions? Who gets to say, well, science is way more important than your sacred mountain? Um, I mean, I've dealt with this with human remains where, for example, you know, most indigenous people do not want their human remains tested in any way. Um, and I work with you know, ancient Egyptian human remains. And part of this project that I was mentioning, reconstructing the ancient faces of these people, I could have done all kinds of testing. We could have, you know, done DNA analysis. We, you know, we could have done all kinds of things. And part of the thing that I had to come back to is, you know, would they give permission if they could actually say something? What would their descendants, if they actually felt, you know, that they could speak for these individuals. Would they give permission? And in the end, what is the benefit of the knowledge that I might gain? And I think this is where acknowledging that different knowledge systems <laughs> exist and that the experience of Native Hawaiians believing that this mountain is sacred is as important as any scientific information we might gain. If we can assume that those things are actually equal, then we can have a conversation. But as long as we don't actually believe that to be true and we've only invited people, invited people to the conversation way down the road when it's almost sort of a done deal, that's, that's not equal. And I think we're never going to you know, have a satisfying resolution when the conversation sort of starts after it's already over. Thanks. So I was interested in your talking about um, how limiting it is to have just kind of one type of knowledge uh, framing an object. Um, because it connects to something I've been thinking about a lot over the last few years. Um, it seems to me, in the time I've been involved in universities, in the last few years there's been a sudden increase in uh, having a more two-way exchange with community-based knowledge and bringing in different types of knowledge, like the knowledge of artists and... And part of me is glad about that, and another part of me is suspicious. Like, what is motivating this yeah. uh, sudden openness to types of knowledge that universities and museums have generally not been interested in uh, and have wanted to privilege only one kind? And I'm interested in what you think about that, both the suspicion around what's motivating this sudden openness and uh, what you think is possible as a result in terms of transformative relations to knowledge within the wider institutions involved? As to what's motivating it, I don't know. I want to be really optimistic. <laughs> I, I hope it's all really, you know, wonderful, positive things. Um, but I think we, you know, we do need to be a little careful about why this is suddenly such a priority. And is it something that people can then just sort of present as, hey, look, we're doing this wonderful thing, believe us, um, but not actually engaging uh, with what then people actually tell them <laughs> that they want from institutions, right? I feel like this happens a fair amount. Um, to me, what's really exciting is seeing 
basically indigenous people in positions of power within museums and institutions who basically can then set the agenda. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of people like Jim Enote, for example, who, you know, uh, Zuni farmer, but also museum specialist who's basically rewriting the way that items are categorized mm -hmm. in museum d databases. I mean, that is fundamental, saying this language is inappropriate. Here's how this, you know, this word fits in with how this object functioned. And, you know, basically linking language, categorization of things, how things are stored, what this object does in sort of relation to all of these other things in the, in the museum archive, to me that's incredibly exciting. Um, and it's happening in a few places, but it's slow. And I think for me that's one of the really frustrating things. How, how much longer do we have to wait until we have enough people in positions of power to say, we're, we're actually going to tell you how we want to organize this. Um, because that, to me, is what comes up over and over again from looking at this archive. Just these strange, arbitrary ways in which things have been categorized and placed in different things. And you know, this happens on archaeological excavations all the time, too. I mean, I've been in you know, the field, and you have a funerary assemblage. There's the individual. There are all of the things associated with the person. And what do you do? First, you take all the human remains and put them here. All the other stuff goes over here. The precious stuff gets you know, registered and sent to the museum. And we have this kind of long history of categorization and removal that's very painful to people. Um, and it's, it's hard to, to read about other people's pain that way and something that happened because of scientific inquiry. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that that can change. Uh, to me, it's, it's still too slow. But the fact that there are these glimmers of hope um, give me a great sense of you know, just hope. One more, maybe? Oh, oh sorry. Is there a hand down here? Yeah. Well, thinking about all this tonight, it almost seems to me that the collections that we have generate more questions than answers. And maybe thinking about the questions is really the value that we get from having the collections. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think knowing that generating more questions at every turn is actually what we're supposed to be doing with it, right? And, and being comfortable with the sense that there will always be more questions. And more that we don't know. Absolutely, absolutely. And knowing that you know, the stories that are associated with these collections always tell a very particular point of view. And part of what our work is is to try and tease out, perhaps, some more of these so little moments. Uh, I'm, I'm actually pretty OK with that. My students hate it when I say that. But I, I actually think that's, that makes the most sense to me. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And please join me in thanking them. Thank you so much.